Amen. God is good. Amen. Well, good morning to all of you. It's good to see you this morning. And let's get right into the Word of God. You open to Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to, Lord willing, go through the whole chapter today. I've entitled this message, message simply Judgment Day. And uh, we're going to get into the Word, and we're going to look at this day that many have mocked and many have made comments about. But here we're going to read exactly what is going to happen on that day. Revelation chapter 20, let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Join me if you're watching online over at Creekside. Let's all pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, you will be glorified through your word. It is your word, not the opinion of men, Lord, but your word. We pray that your word would go forth with your promise that it will not return to you void, but accomplish your divine will. And then, Lord, grant us ears to hear and hearts to receive your word, that we might bear fruit to your glory. Lord, there is none like you. We thank you, Father, for life. We thank you for Jesus. Be glorified, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it, and we all said amen. amen. All right, one accord in agreement, amen. Jesus taught us to pray, Father, let thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And here we find that the kingdom of God is in the earth, but it will be ruling the earth for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. And we see that here. We see, we'll see that here in our text. There are actually four events taking place here in Revelation chapter 20. The first one is that we will see where the devil is bound. He's bound and cast into prison. And then the second event is that saints, that's you and I, those who are believers in Jesus Christ, will be ruling and reigning with Jesus for a thousand years. Amen? And then thirdly, we, we will see a satanic rebellion. And lastly, we will see the sentencing of the condemned. So we begin here with Satan being bound. In verse 1, John writes, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottom of his pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after this, these things, he must be released for a little while. So the devil here, first and foremost, we see is bound for a thousand years. And notice it only takes one angel to bind the devil to or apprehend him, which is a testament to the fact that the devil really was never in charge. God allowed him to exist for his own purpose and glory. And what is that purpose and what is that glory? Well, the purpose is for the salvation of souls and for the glorification of his son. He's thrown into the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit, that phrase is mentioned seven times in the book of Revelation. It is also called the abyss. We've talked about it before if you've been here for the study in Revelation. The abyss, also known as the abode of demons. This is where he is incarcerated for a thousand years. Well, what will a Satanless world look like? You know, the Bible gives us a, a little glimpse. It's found in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 11 and Isaiah chapter 65. And I want to read that. I think it's worth going back and reading Isaiah chapter 11. There's a portion of it I want to read to you to give you an idea of what the world will be like in a saintless, what the situation would be like on the earth without the devil being in it. Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, I need to get to Isaiah. Amen. I can't read. Daniel, <laughs> amen, I thought I was there. All right, Isaiah chapter 11, and I have you starting at verse 1, but let's, let's cheat and, and skip ahead to verse 6. And he's describing again the millennial reign of Christ, the conditions that will exist during the millennial reign of Christ. He says that the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. 
and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young, young ones shall, be, shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. Son, going on out there and play in the cobra's hole. And the winged child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain. That's in particular speaking of Jerusalem, but it's all over the earth. Because listen to what he says. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, Isaiah 65. Isaiah chapter 65. Again, we're going to cheat. We're not going to start at verse 17. We'll start at verse 20. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days. Nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old. But the sinner, being 100 years old, shall be cursed, accursed. They shall dwell in houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall, build, uh, they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall the days of my people. Shall be the days of my people and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, uh, nor bring forth children for trouble. They shall be the descendants of the blessed God and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. And then he says here in verse 25, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The dust shall uh, be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor uh, destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The holy mountain being Jerusalem. So what period of time are they talking about when, you know, the lion and the lamb are laying down together and all of that? It's during the millennial reign of Christ. So what's happening during the millennial reign of Christ? What would the world be like? Well, the enmity between humans and and animal life will, will disappear. God didn't create animals to eat humans. Go back to Genesis. Amen? And uh, there will be longevity of life will be common at that time. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a little bit here. But uh, there will also be peace on the earth. Why? Because the world, earth will have been restored. Amen. Because Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning for a thousand years. That's what it, the world will look like with a, a, a Satanless world. Amen. There will finally be peace. Amen. In the Middle East. But here the Bible says, in verses 1 to 3, that at the end of the millennium, Satan will be released. Now, why would God release the devil after 1,000 years? And besides, won't everybody believe in Jesus Christ after being under his reign for 1,000 years and all of that? Well, the answer is, the short answer is no. It's evidenced by the rebellion that we find in verse 7 to 10 that we will get to in just a moment. And um, so God releases the devil. Well, why does the Lord release the devil? Well, the Lord releases the devil. For, for one thing, he didn't incarcerate him to rehabilitate him. Amen. <laughs> but he incarcerated him to demonstrate his mercy toward mankind for yet another 1,000 years. And he releases him. To finally rid his kingdom of all who would seek to do the devil's bidding. Now we come to the saints reigning in verses 4 to 6. Verse 4, and I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus. And when were they beheaded? Well, it says, and they were beheaded for the, and, and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image. These were beheaded then during the tribulation period. And had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their heads, their foreheads or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is He who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him 
a thousand years. Amen. Saints are reigning here. The thrones that John mentions in verse 4 are thrones we will sit on as we rule and reign with Christ. Judgment will be committed to us. Amen. Yes, us. <laughs> the saints of God, those who believe, will be, will be given governing authority by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ throughout the world. Those who have been martyred during the tribulation, the Bible says here, will also rule and reign with the Lord. In verse 5, he uses that phrase is there, that phrase of but the rest, and the question comes up, well, who are the rest? The rest are those, are humanity, the rest is the rest of humanity is what it's speaking about here, awaiting the final judgment, which we will find in verses 11 to 15. And note, those who partake of the first resurrection, he says, are called what? Blessed and holy. For them, John says, the second death has no power. What is the second death? Well, it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 11 to 15. We'll get there in just a, a little while here. But here's the idea. Everybody's going to be resurrected. The righteous and the wicked. We're all going to face a resurrection. The question is, is it a resurrection to everlasting life or everlasting damnation? Everybody, you, you got a resurrection coming. But the type of resurrection it is depends on you. The choices that you make now, your relationship with Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, that's what Jesus said. John chapter 5 says, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted to the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is a son of man. He is our Savior. Do not marvel, Jesus said. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. All, not some, all. Resurrection is not unique to Christians. All will come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The resurrection of life is that first resurrection where people are called blessed and holy. That's the resurrection of the believer, of those who are in Christ. The resurrection of condemnation represents those who have walked in wickedness and who have rejected Jesus Christ, and they are of the second death mentioned in verse 6. But regardless, everybody will stand before the Lord. Everyone will stand before the Lord. Everyone will be resurrected, I should say. In Philippians chapter 2, the Bible clearly tells us that the, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of those in heaven and of every, and, and those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hey, here's the deal. You may reject him now. You may sit here with attitude with your arms folded and, and scoff and all of that, but you will bow. Every knee will bow. And it, 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 it's wise to bow now because you're going to have to bow later. Yes, Amen. I'm not going to bow. Oh, yes, you will. Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so the Bible tells us here that, that those who who reign with the Lord, those who are of the first resurrection, that is the redeemed of the Lord, who are called blessed and holy, those who are now judged by the world will judge the world. Amen. That's you and I. Amen. That is believers. And in light of that fact that we are called to judge the world, Paul rebukes the church in Corinth, and he says this, because they were dragging each other into court and slandering each other and all that. And Paul says this in a form of rebuke to the church in Corinth. He says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, you are unworthy, uh, or judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? What is he saying? You know, there's wisdom. 
We should be operating in the wisdom of God now. In other words, seeing that we will judge the world and even fallen angels, let us now judge matters socially, personally, politically in accordance with God's truth as his priest. Amen. So, oh, Pastor, I'm not a priest. You must I have a collar kind of type, but I'm not a priest. I'm not talking about, you know, some that priest. I'm talking about the, the priesthood of Christ. The Bible says we are all, as believers, a part of a royal priesthood. Therefore, we should act like it. That's what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth. Why are you dragging each other in the court? Do you not have wisdom to judge according to the word of God, God's truth? But what we've done in the church is that we have set aside the, the word of God, the wisdom of God, and we start judging one another according to the standard and the wisdom of this world. And that is sinful. You who are going to judge the world and judge angels, should we not be able to judge the smallest of matters socially, personally, politically, by, con by referring to the word of God as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Too often the case is that Christians make decisions on their own. They don't seek godly counsel or wisdom. They don't come in and say, we're having trouble in our marriage and I'm, 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 I'm tempted to divorce my spouse, but you know, pastor, what does the word of God say? They make up their own minds, you know. They have a Burger King mentality and wisdom that walk around. You deserve a break today. No, that's McDonald's, amen, or whatever. <laughs> they have a fast food mentality, a fast food theology. And they wonder why things don't work out and why their life is so hard. Could it be we who will judge the world are judging our lives and everything else and all our decisions according to the world when we ought to be priests of God judging according to his truth because that's the way we're going to judge the world amen <laughs> believers are ruling and reigning with jesus the third event that we find here is a satanic rebellion john packs a lot here to chapter 20 verses 7 to 10 now then the thousand, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, that's all over the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number, listen, is as the sand of the sea. They went up, <coughs> excuse me, on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, that is Jerusalem, they were surrounding the headquarters of the Lord. Jesus will rule and reign from Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beasts and the false prophets are. And they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> a satanic rebellion. Satan's satanic has, has a case of satanic recidivism. He relapses after he's released into his old ways. Again, the Lord didn't send him there to rehabilitate him, but to extend mercy to us to mankind for a thousand years. But what blows my mind here is that under a thousand years under the rule of Jesus Christ, the people, people on earth will still sin against the Lord during the thousand year reign of Christ. You know, if you, you hold vipers in your hand and you know, go up to lions and just rub their mane and you know, do all these different things. Despite the goodness of God on the earth, people will still sin against the Lord. But I guess we could say nothing much has changed. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 20 says, For the child, remember we read, the child shall die 100 years old, but the sin, sinner, being 100 years old, shall be accursed. 
In other words, people during this time, the Lord is so good that people will live a lot longer during the millennial reign of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, premature death and death by moderate means or a moderate age, like dying in your 80s or your 90s, shall be almost unknown. Almost unknown. I say almost because death will still be with us. But Isaiah tells in Isaiah 65, verse 20, it's talking about a child uh, shall die 100 years old. What does it mean, that, mean by saying that? Basically that if a person dies being 100 years old, they're going to be considered a child. You've been living 100 years. Oh, you're just still wet behind the ears. You know what you're doing. Wait, come see me when you're 400. Okay? You, you really don't have any experience in life. No, that's, going to, that's, that's, that's what it means that a child, it'll be a person dying, you know, at 100 would be considered dying as a, as a child. But a sinner, and, for, and, and of course, death will still be on the earth during the millennial reign of Christ because death is not thrown into hell until verse 13. We'll get there. Amen? So during the millennial reign of Christ, the Lord may have to use resort to death as a last resort to judge some of the sinners, some of the people who are rebelling against his reign. Are you with me? Yes, sir. One yes, sir. The rest of you <laughs> talking among yourselves. Amen. <laughs> he mentions here Gog and Magog there in verse 8. Now, what does this have to do with this? Is where people get a little confused. They think, oh, this is Ezekiel 38 and 39. No, it's not. Because this battle happens at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. Ezekiel 38 and 39 happens in the last days leading up to the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. Two different battles. So why is he mentioned Gog and Magog? He mentions Gog and Magog basically to, as an example here to say the devil's going to deceive the nations like Gog deceived Magog. Amen? The devil's going to come and deceive the nations once again. And as Magog followed their leader, Gog, so the nations will follow the deception of the devil leading to his demise. So that's the reason why he's mentioning Gog and Magog here. They surround Jerusalem. They're going to attack. They're going to, they're going to take Jesus down. And what happens? Well, there's no long, stretched out, long uh, uh, campaign or anything. The Bible says simply, God rains down fire from heaven and destroys them. Short order, amen? Amen. And he destroys the enemies <coughs> that come against our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. And the devil is dispatched, deposed, disposed of, I should say, forever, thrown into hell along with the Antichrist and the false prophet. So that's the end of that satanic rebellion. Then we come to the last event in chapter 20. It is the sentencing of the condemned. Get ready. It's a little deep. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it for those for, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. So true. You can run, but you cannot hide. David said in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12, we don't we'll have the time to read the whole thing, but he basically says there, you know, Lord, where can I go from your presence? How foolish it is for us as believers to know the Lord and then, to, you know, think we can get away from the Lord. Lord, where can I go from your presence? Amen. In fact, the Bible says it's better to have never known the Lord than to know him and to walk away. Because he, he's got your address. Where can I go, Lord, from your presence? Answer, nowhere. He said, if I make my bed in hell, Lord, you are there. There's no place. You, you can run, but you cannot hide. And you can ignore what I'm saying this morning. You can be watching online. You can ignore the words of the Lord. You can run, but you can't hide. God always knows where we are. Earth and heaven will flee from his presence. There's no place for them. Verse 12, he says, and I saw the dead, great and small standing before God and books were open. And another book 
was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead and, uh, who were in it, and, and death and Hades, there it is, delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Amen. Let's unpack this. In Judaism, you've heard me say this before, but it bears repeating again. In Judaism, the, 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 they had the teaching that basically said there's two places people went. Jew, Judaism is a Jewish religion. Two places people went when they died. They went to the place of the uh, righteous dead or they went to the place of the wicked dead. The place of the righteous dead was similar to heaven. The place of the wicked dead was a place where they'd be tormented by demons forever. Now, people think, oh, well, that was just religion and doesn't mean a whole lot. Well, it's interesting that Jesus actually confirms this doctrine in a story he told about Lazarus poor man and the rich man. I want us to read it because I want you to get the, the whole full, the gist of it. Luke chapter 16. Amen. Luke chapter 16. And we'll begin at verse 19. Let me read this, read this account to you. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day, but there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, but he went to another place. What place is that? Well, the Bible says, verse 23 here in Luke chapter 16, and being in torment, torments, plural, in Hades. Hades is not hell, it's the grave. It's the place of the wicked dead. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Not that Abraham was holding Lazarus in his, to his chest, but that Lazarus was there with Abraham. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip, just the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. And people talk about, oh, we get to hell, we're going to party. No. I don't think so. Verse 25, and Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus the evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us uh, and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to, the, to you cannot, nor can those uh, from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him, that is Lazarus, to my brother's house, for I have five brothers, that they may testify, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, oh no, Father, you don't get it. Father Abraham, you know, Father was just a title, a, 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 a phrase of respect. Father Abraham, uh, but, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And I remind you that one has come from the dead. We're going to celebrate his resurrection in a few weeks. Amen. If one would just come from the dead, oh, they would repent. And then Abraham said, but he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, if they do not respond to my word, as people are hearing the word even now as I speak, it's not the vessel, it's the word. And the Lord says, they have my word. If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one, 
though one rise from the dead. Amen, Lord. You are so true. You're so true. Because the world is still not persuaded, even though one is risen from the dead to this very day. There's a great gulf between them that separates them. Jesus was not just telling them a nice little story, but explaining to them what happened to the godly, the righteous dead, and what happens to the godless, the wicked dead. Remember when he was on the cross, he said to the one thief who believed in him, today you will be with me in paradise. Is that what the Lord said? My question is, why didn't he say, today you will be with me in heaven? Well, isn't that paradise? No. And the reason why he didn't say, today you will be with me in, be with me in heaven, is because no one had gone to heaven. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor. Follow me. Don't get lost. Heaven was made accessible after the resurrection of Christ and after he fulfilled the role of high priest. After. Jesus told the thief, I'll be with you in paradise, a.k.a. Abraham's bosom, a.k.a. the place of the righteous dead. And he went there for a short time. But he also ascended to make atonement for our sins. Why do I say that? Oh, the book of Hebrews explains all of it. Jesus did not come to be a sacrificial lamb only, but he fulfilled the role of a high priest for our atonement. Amen. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, talks about the fact that he went into the Holy of Holies, into the temple that is in heaven, not on earth, because the temple on earth is only a copy of the temple in heaven. But the temple today is destroyed. It was destroyed in 70 AD in Jerusalem. Jesus went into the temple in heaven. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, there he presented his own blood as atonement for our sins. Now, why is that significant? Because the high priest throughout the history of the Jews until the temple was destroyed would go into the Holy of Holies the sacred part of the temple, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur is called, happening this year, October 8th and 9th. They're still doing it, but there's no temple. But Jesus went into the temple, but a high priest would do it once a year, and he would offer the blood of an innocent sacrificed lamb on the top of the mercy seat of God, the Ark of the Covenant, and the Holy of Holies, for the forgiveness for the entire nation of Israel. But he would have to do it year after year after year after year. It was just a temporary fix. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, Jesus Christ took his own blood, offered it in the holy of holies in heaven, and he did it once and for all. Amen? That's the good news of the gospel. He doesn't have to go in year after year after year after. It's not religion. He brought us into a right relationship with the living God. Offering himself once and for all. Amen. So nobody had gone into heaven until he had finished that work of atonement. Well, when did he finish it? He finished it when he went, ascended into heaven. He ascended as our high priest to make atonement for our sin. He went to Abraham's bosom, to paradise, because people often ask, well, what happened to those who died before Jesus went to the cross and, and rose from the dead? What happened to those in Hebrews chapter 11 who died having not received the promise? Where did they go? They didn't go to heaven. You have to be cleansed. You have to be holy to enter into the presence of the Lord. What happened to those from the days of Noah and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, where did all those people go? They went to Abraham's bosom. Why is it called Abraham's bosom? Because God made a promise to Abraham, the promise of Messiah, the promise of a Savior. 
Abraham's bosom, Abraham's promise. They were abiding in a place called paradise. It was Abraham's bosom. But Jesus, who ascended, made atonement for all of our sins. And then he descended that he might lead captivity captive into the presence of God. So this all happened very quickly. It wasn't a long, drawn-out thing. But he had to go finish the high priest's role, offered his blood once and for all. Then he descended to the place of Abraham's bosom where the saints who had died before, who had not received a promise, were being, were being held. And he led them out of that place into glory. Well, I think you're making that up, Pastor. <laughs> I always let the word validate the word. Ephesians 4, 7 to 10, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, Paul explains, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth, not hell as some falsely teach. Jesus went to hell. No, he did it. He went to Abraham's bosom, and he led captivity captive. What does it mean? It means that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth to Abraham's bosom. He also descended. uh, uh, He who also descended is also he who what? Ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Amen? Thank you, Paul, for the explanation. Thus, my point in saying all this and getting to, to back to our text is Abraham's bosom, paradise, the place of the righteous dead, no longer exists. There are those in Christianity who teach about purgatory. That when Christians die, they go to purgatory. And I believe the origins of that false teaching, because it is false, is Judaism. They still think there's a place you go, a waiting room that the righteous dead go to, and we wait. And some teach, some Christian circles teach you, you have to offer indulgences or some type of offering or whatever to help, or prayers to get that person out of purgatory into heaven. That's not in the word of God. Amen. Amen. It is false teaching. And I don't apologize for telling you that. So then what happens to Christians? There's, There's no need to go to a waiting room anymore. Why do I say that? Because of what Paul says. Paul the Apostle said in 2 Corinthians 5 eight, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So for the believer, this is after the resurrection of Christ. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have free access into glory. When we drop here on earth, We appear in his presence in heaven. Amen. We don't go to a waiting room, a purgatory. We go right into the very presence of God. Because he has made atonement. He has fulfilled the the, the role of our everlasting high priest. And so, therefore, we have free access. When we leave this world, we go to the next, into the very presence of the Lord. Amen. Hey, that's the good news of the gospel. The bad news is that the place of the wicked dead is still open for business. There's still vacancy there. And so those who occupy that place in verses 12 and 13 are resurrected to be judged. (laughs) Wait a minute, Pastor. That's what I imagine people doing. (laughs) Wait wait a minute, Pastor. The books are open. Doesn't that mean they have a chance? God's got the books and he's going to compare notes and And they're going to have more attaboys and bad stuff. And God's going to say, okay, you got one more good thing, overcoming all the bad things. Come on into my kingdom. Is that going to happen? No. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it defies the word of God to believe that. That our good works are going to outweigh our bad. And that's going to be our ticket into heaven. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of what? Works. You can't earn your way to heaven. 
You can't be good enough to get into heaven. Our righteousness is but a filthy rag, the Bible says, in the presence of God. We can't be holy enough. We needed a Savior. We needed a Redeemer. Redeemer, Amen. It is by the righteousness of Christ, not our righteousness. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. Nobody's going to be in heaven talking about, yeah, yeah, I helped the Lord out a little bit. <sighs> he needed me. No. We bring nothing to the table. He gave everything. So what are these books? These books contain the acts of those who are being condemned. They are, listen to me, they are the records which justify the judgment of God. That's what it is. The books are open. The books are open. The judgment of God. Why is God judging them then? If they're already condemned, why is he judging them? He's judging them to determine the degree of torment they will have in hell. <laughs> Wait, and there you go again, right? <laughs> Remember what Jesus said. He said in rebuking Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. If you go to Israel with us in May, we'll see Capernaum, the ruins of it. It was the Lord's headquarters by the Sea of Galilee that he spent a lot of time in, the city of Capernaum. He rebukes these three cities because they ignored his mighty works. Jesus said to them, it will be more tolerable for Sodom. Now, Sodom's not getting off the hook. He said it would be more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment than for you, you three cities. Because you saw the Messiah, you saw his mighty works, and yet you refuse to believe. God holds every one of us accountable for what we know. You sat in church. You heard the word. You knew the gospel. You understood the truth. And yet you would not believe it's going to be more worse for you on that day than it will be for Sodom. That's what he's saying. My friend, hell is serious business. Another reason... And, of course, Jesus said that. You can go back and uh, check it out in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 to 24. But for us, let me just say this, for us as believers, however, we will not. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, then say if you're a strong believer, weak believer, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will not appear before the great right throne judgment we're reading about here. You know why? Here's the reason why. There's no books on you. Your record has been demolished through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. The books are open as a sign of judgment. And we will not stand in judgment because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Because Christ took our judgment on the cross for us. And through faith in him, we've been delivered from the wrath and the judgment on this day. Jeremiah 31, 34 says it well. The Lord God says, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Lord, remember that sin. What sin? Your case has been thrown out. Your record has been abolished. Only our works will be judged. I talked about that some time ago. Our works will be judged. Uh, what we build on the foundation of Jesus' name will be judged. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. But we ourselves will not appear before the white, great white throne judgment. Another reason for God's judgment, and I, I you know, found this out some years ago as I was like, man, Lord, it's kind of, you know, to raise him up from Hades, which we know from the Lord's story about the rich man is a place of torment. People think, well, we're going to go to hell and party or whatever. No, you know, it, Hades, the place of the wicked dead, is a place of torment. They're going to come, be resurrected from the place of torment, stand before the great white throne judgment, and then be sentenced to an eternal hell. I thought, Lord, that's, isn't that like overkill? Why don't you just like leave them there or just send them straight there? No, this is why God does, because God is not only a God of love and mercy, he's a God of justice. 
He's a just God. And he judges them publicly before all mankind, before the, all of his creation, so that they would know that he is a just God. David cleared this up for me when he said in Psalm 51, verse 4, he said, Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. There will be no miscarriage of judgment on that day. Nobody will be able to say, well, that's not fair. Because they have the books. And God wants to know when you're committed to hell, sentenced to hell, that you have actually sentenced yourself. And he's just in his judgment. Verse 14, death and Hades is the, the Hades being the grave is all thrown into hell as well. There'll be no more grave. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death. And the saddest verse, I think, in all the Bible, and everyone, and anyone rather, not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Some people think the idea that God, excuse me, when you come to Christ, God says, oh, I see that hand. Okay, let me write that person's name down. Oh, I see your hand. He writes that name down. He's writing people in the book of life. The reality is that he blots us out. The Bible says that God wishes that none should perish. Everybody has a chance to come to him. But when we leave this world in rebellion against God, resisting his love and his gospel, then we leave condemned. And therefore, God has to blot out your name. It's not that he, you know, I never wrote their name down. No, he has to blot it out. Why? Because he wishes that none should perish. Everybody's name is in the book. But God will blot names out. Amen? He said, well, I don't know about that, but, you know, I, and I get it from just looking at scriptures, Deuteronomy 25, verse 6, Psalm 69, verse 28, Psalm 109, verse 13, speaks about God blotting out people's names as if they were already written in there. But then he blots them out. Amen. Amen. Well, let me say, well, I can't believe I'm almost done. You're sitting there going, about time. <laughs> this is good stuff. In conclusion, <laughs> sadly, many church members will be standing before the great white throne judgment. I didn't say those who are born again. I'm saying church members. Because a lot of people believe that they have a church membership, they're on their way to heaven, but they've never been born again. Jesus will say on that day we just read about, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's someone in relationship with the Father who obeys the word of God. Then it's not talking about perfect people, but those who are in relationship with the Father through faith in Christ. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? I had a TV show. You know, I wrote books in your name. Cast out demons in your name. I had a, a, a traveling show. We went and rented out these uh, uh, ballrooms and hotels and, and had invited naive believers to come in and, and fake, you know, healings and stuff. And, and all that. Oh, we, we healed people in your name. We've done many wonders, Lord, in your name. Oh, I, I, I'm the guy who was selling the, the miracle water from the Jordan that actually came out of my kitchen sink faucet. Amen. I'm the person selling the, a special anointing oil that promises prosperity. Remember me, Lord. Oh, I, yeah, heard about you. But then he will declare to them, I never knew you. Never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice iniquity, lawlessness. Listen, my friend, God desires not to blot out your name, but to blot out your sins. Isaiah 44, 22, the Lord says, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. The great joy that we have as believers is this, is that he knows my name. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life to never be removed. He knows your name. 
I was telling a brother of the other service that, you know, he knows my name. There's times I act like I don't know his name. Amen. But he never forgets my name. He knows my name. Aren't you glad he knows your name? This is the assurance we have in him. Amen. Amen. And your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. See, the Lord sent his son because he desires to not blot out your name, but to blot out your sins. Jesus said, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Father, we thank you for your word today.